Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Thursday night in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, one of the things that I've been watching all season given the La Nina is the persistence of troughs of low pressure just off the West Coast. And if you look from all of June through most of July now, we have really favored more troughing here than anything else. In other words, there's not been persistent ridging at all. So the jet stream has, of course, come south of that, and it's run up over a ridge that's migrated from like the Mid-South over to the Southern Plains and eventually the Four Corners State. And that's what's, uh, what's really been the cause of the excessive drought here uh, while ridge riding storms have come over the top and kind of cascaded in a direction just like this. So any long range forecast has to be asking the question as to when something like this is going to break. And we've been alluding to all week uh, a pattern shift, but we just wanted to consistently see the models show that. And I want to make a case for why I think this is a, legit, a legitimate breakdown of what's going on, despite the fact that La Nina is still there. We'll talk about that in just a second. Because this particular pattern uh, has led us to some pretty interesting stuff. And I put this in my morning report this morning, but i got to show all of you that just watched the Thursday and Monday video content. Uh, Iowa State University, Daryl Herzman, phenomenal meteorologist. I really envy this guy and his ability to make great maps and do good analysis. Uh, it's, it's quite stellar what he does. But he put together a really interesting map, and I want to show it to you again here. Uh, if you read the title, it's Departure of 2022 Hours, so this year, with a heat index greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So when we're looking at this, we're trying to see this compared to the climatology. And a, a huge area where that ridge just sat from Texas into the lower Mississippi River Valley. Uh, has had well in excess of 100 hours when we think about that departure. Uh, that's a heat index over 100 Fahrenheit, which remember, usually we only hit that at you know certain parts of the day, so we've had extended heat in this area, all because of, of this particular pattern setup. We've also talked extensively about the drought that is in parts of Kansas, of course, into Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, patches throughout the Corn Belt, uh, Indiana, and, and, and um, parts of Iowa, and there are even pockets in Illinois, and then the drought that's been in parts of New England. Places that have seen a lot more routine rainfall have been over here in the southeast, including lately parts of Kentucky, including a huge storm uh, that came out of Kentucky, went into Tennessee last night, and then along the northern tier of the U.S. And today I, I had the privilege of kind of driving from Pierre to Sioux Falls on I-90, and I'll be honest, the crop actually looked pretty good. I saw very little stress in this area uh, just driving through here today and coming home on Interstate 57 this evening. Um, a lot of the crop in this area looked better than I would have anticipated it looking, giving some of the earlier drought stresses. But still, the area that we're most concerned about is down here, and we just need to continue to see um, how long this hangs on and if this pattern change we've been discussing breaks away and brings some relief to this area, and then how long does it do that for. Also, notice the West Coast. We've had some hotter and drier conditions moving in, and we expect to see a lot more of that, and some of the wildfire stuff we talked about earlier in the week is going to continue in parts of the Pacific Northwest going forward with this forecast. Another way to look at it is, I just want to go back again, this is a little over a 40 day time period here that we're looking at, and uh, I just want to show you those stats again. We have a lot of places down here in the Mid-South, getting into the Southern Plains, that are, are, are looking at near record setting dryness, and in some places in here haven't measured rainfall in the last 40 plus days. So the question again is, the pattern that got us here, is it actually changing in a way that we have confidence in it changing. And what does that change mean? Because with the heat that's still on here, combined with the very dry soils, we've had evaporation rates from two to three and a half inches a week in the Southern Plains. And the Western Corn Belt, there's been pockets that have really dried out as of late too. So this pattern shift is gonna be quite critical. And I was amazed, I put this in a report earlier this week, but I just wanna show the broader audience here that watched this Thursday night video of just how devastatingly bad this drought is. Uh, I have not been to Texas and Oklahoma uh, since late spring, so I haven't seen the extent of this drought, but some of the pictures that just keep showing up are incredible. Uh, this one here from Andy uh, Carthel, just showing uh, near, this is kind of west of Amarillo, just the extent of the drought across his cotton fields. Uh, just, uh, if we made this black and white and put it in a book about the Dust Bowl, I, I think it would be believable if you took out that wind turbine. Uh, just incredible to see that. So what's the cause for the change? Well, we alluded to this on Monday and kind of kept track of it all week. These trade winds are still cooking. I mean, they're still there. A strong La Nina signal. We have a negative Indian Ocean dipole signal. That's where there's warmer water here and cooler water there. That's very common when there's a La Nina. You know, it still extends into both hemispheres. And as we discussed, the, the warmer water that's showing up here is simply due to the fact <clears throat> there's not a whole lot of cold, anomalously cold water to continue to upwell. 
I think the biggest changes have happened here between Hawaii and Alaska and here uh, into the Bering Sea in this part of the North Pacific. And as we discuss, I think the net effect of this is to change the downstream pattern by impacting the way the jet stream has to roll over these things. And it's moved farther to the north. And it's eliminated that trough that had been here. So if it moves farther to the north and that trough is gone, that means the heat starts to build in the west. And if the heat begins to build in the west, just due to the just simple jet, uh, jet stream wavelength, you ha you'll end up getting troughing that happens around the Hudson Bay. And that's that extent of this troughing over the Hudson Bay that I think is going to be critical to this whole pattern, breaking down where we've had the extensive drought while developing it, unfortunately, in the western part of the United States. So here's what the 12Z Euro, this is the operational run, is suggesting. So as we go through the weekend, this is Friday, getting into Saturday and Sunday, this is the first time I've seen any sort of persistence in a forecast of developing a ridge here. And what you end up getting by the time we get into Monday is flow that does something like this. So no longer do we have the dominant ridge sitting here or over the four corner states. It's now the most anomalously higher heights are here in the Gulf of Alaska. So this brings in the heat to the west, but this starts to deliver weak frontal boundaries that just come slicing through the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes, New England, and there's a chance they're going to stretch far enough south to hit the Mid-South and Southern Plains because we have not shut off the Gulf moisture. In fact, if you leave a big subtropical ridge sitting here, we'll keep that subtropical moisture, or excuse me, the tropical moisture coming in. But the issue is with this heat coming in, starting you know this weekend or early next week, we see that NOAA is has issued uh, now for the end of the month of um, July and the beginning of August, they've now changed this up to a, a high risk of excessive heat in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm gonna have to be watching carefully to see what this might mean in terms of the development of wildfires, given that evaporation rates will be so very high under this uh, heat in this particular, that's been a warming trend all week long. But on the precipitation side of this, I'd like to show you um, the latest 12Z European Ensemble. We're going to watch a five-day sliding window. So this is Thursday to Tuesday, and as I slide it, you just add one day on the end and take one off the beginning. And what you're going to notice is that as the trough continues to develop over the Hudson Bay and those fronts come through, they're meeting quite a bit of warm and moist and unstable air. And so as you watch me take this all the way out to day 5 through 10, which ends on July 31st, you see the model's got a large corridor in through here with above average precipitation. Now just remember, this is an ensemble average. What we're really seeing here is the chance of precipitation along these weak frontal boundaries increasing. There still be thunderstorm complexes, which means some folks will get a lot more rain than others, and unfortunately some places will be missed. And there's a lot of places in the Mid-South and Southern Plains that need days of this to recover. But as we work our way out there now into the first week of August, the models have had this very consistent picture being painted of how the precipitation anomalies are going to change during that time. And that's the most significant thing that's going to happen as we shift, oops, sorry, as we shift this ridge into place and, and it looks like to leave it there for at least um, the end of July and the very beginning of August. Now, once we think out there past that time frame, I'm going to flip right over to the European weeklies. And let's just go look at the whole month of August. So we're going to take it forward a little bit. We're going to stop it right here. This would be August 1st through the 31st. Now what you notice is that the model, because it was initialized much wetter, backed off on the, the drought expanse in the central part of the United States. That's what we would expect. Um, also, because of these shifts in the depth of the, of the Hudson trough, there will likely be more thunderstorms kind of cascading out of the northwest in this area. And we still keep the subtropical ridge for the most part off the coast, which means we're going to feed this. And that's what leads to those stationary boundaries we talk so much about. We see the southwestern monsoon opening up a bit more. Uh, and uh, I'm really glad to see this. They've taken the drier bias out of the Canadian prairie. That was something we talked about on Monday that we thought we would likely see change uh, in this forecast overall. So you, you take this out and just look at it, and, and this is quite favorable for a lot of folks across the United States. The biggest risk area now um, starts to transition over to the Pacific Northwest as that ridge becomes established. Now, we cannot take the fact that there is still a La Nina, okay, it is still there, off the table, which means that despite how we're discussing right now some relief, uh, you'll see it from the heat a little bit, but relief from the, 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 the persistent drought conditions, um, there's nothing to say that this is going to last. Like we're just going to keep all of that um, 
you know, the, the heat in the West, because it all depends on how the jet stream responds to these things. So I just wanted to be clear about that. And just to show you here, the model is still quite warm overall, but it has backed off in the, in the depth of this heat. And again, re return more of it here to the Pacific Northwest. That's the latest European outlook for the month uh, of August. Now we're gonna add uh, another layer onto this. And the layer we're gonna add on is the new CPC data that was released today. I was hoping it was gonna be released at the end of last week, but it took about an extra week to get this out for some reason this time. The CPC does a phenomenal job. I, I'm very um, envious of their, of their team and they do great work. I think right now a lot of their long range forecasts though are very um, much informed by the persistent La Nina. Because if you look at these August to October timeframes when we had La Ninas, they tended to center a lot of the drier conditions in the upper Midwest, extending that down here through the, you know, the western side of the lower Mississippi River Valley and wet on the east coast for the most part. So when you look at that, the reason why I stress that is because this was their newest update. So let's go look uh, here. There it is. That is the, <clears throat> that is the August, September, October. And you see, there's the wet, there's the drier here, but they favored more dry conditions extending from the southern plains uh, back into, um, well, really the, the western plains and high plains back here into the Great Basin, the northern side of Great Basin, Snake River Valley. So I look at that and I can't, um, I can see what they're doing here uh, with the influence of the La Nina. Um, I, you know, this is just me, uh, just questioning it I would question if, if this is really going to go over to below normal in this area and I would also question the extent of, of how dry this particular area is going to be sure it's consistent with La Nina but just a couple of things I'm on the lookout for if you're along the Gulf Coast to the East Coast it, it's a wild card anyway because you could be really dry and then a tropical system could show up out of you know literally out of nowhere um, and and really ch change the whole precipitation pattern but I would like to show you something here and to find that, let's go right over here to the three month outlook. And I wanna show you what they're looking at longer term. So the August, September, October temperature, this is where they're getting, uh, this is their, their model that's uh, giving you the ideas that we just saw on temperatures there. And if we go back, we can also look quickly at their precipitation output. So again, you see that influence there more in the upper Midwest. Yeah, see they're, they're these anomalies are not as strong as they had once been. So that's that's what's driving this. But take a look, because there's um, because they're so focused on this La Nina. If we go out all the way to winter, they've got another winter La Nina forecast. Remember, that's always dry in the South like this, uh, and this would be very wet in the Ohio River Valley. You probably heard me say that every winter for the last uh, two winters. And their temperature forecast during that time period, again, warmer, drier south, that's a La Nina forecast to the T for December, January, February. So I thought we would just look at it here, just uh, something to kind of keep our eyes on moving forward. Well, speaking of moving forward, uh, we right now don't have much tropical activity, a lot of dust coming across the uh, open Atlantic Ocean, and there's no major short waves that have, that have come out here. But it is important to note that we have a lot of good rising motion over the Indian Ocean and the other part of this here goes over Africa. So if you take a look at the um, longer range, this will be day 11 through 15, velocity potentials, they're increasing in this area again, which could kick off those easterly waves. Just to take note here, this La Nina, I, that is so strong. Uh, these trade winds are still moving so fast in here and they're meeting this westerly wind burst, so a lot of rising motion in MJO phase four, five, and six. And unfortunately, because it is summer, these MJO correlations are not nearly as strong as they are in fall, winter, and spring, which is why you don't see me using them as often as I do uh, at other times. I think more importantly, we have to focus on really the position of that Pacific jet rather than this large tropical influence. But uh, coming back to the tropics, do notice that the European model, the 12Z run, is attempting to develop you know, tropical lows. These are the tracks of those tro tropical lows. So we are moving ourselves here at the end of July into a time period where we're gonna have to keep an eye here. Plus the ocean temperatures in the Caribbean, just off the coast and also here in the uh, Gulf of Mexico are warmer than normal. So if the shear calms down and we have some storms initiate, we, we would expect to see development as we move forward. Well, right now, just this evening as the sun was starting to set here, we were watching um, complexes of storms that were kind of rolling right down here through the mid-Atlantic and North Carolina, South Carolina. Big storm complexes blowing up down in parts of Alabama and Georgia. And also, look at this one down here, very large thunderstorm complex that came through parts of um, 
of Arkansas. Now I'm going to be watching these storms here and these here for what their outflow might eventually do moving forward through the Corn Belt. I'll show you why in just a second. Um, don't see nearly as much smoke out of that fire that was in uh, Idaho, uh, and, and that's good to see. But I would like to show you something interesting here. So when I was flying home today from Sioux Falls back to Chicago, um, I actually flew over some of these storms right here in southern Wisconsin. In fact, can I go show you this? I, I hope you like this. So if we take a close look, let's choose this view. Now watch this. So these storms right here, they're not much to look at, but see that one there and there? They actually didn't even produce much precipitation. They eventually blew up into the storms that came across. Uh, you can see them here really uh, seeding these storms here. But uh, when I was flying over them right here, I actually just took some video of what they look like. And uh, there they are. I thought you might find that interesting. Did you notice, let me go back here and show you, there's an anvil here and another one, a small one right there. Those two things, one and two, those are right here, and you'll see in a few seconds, there. They're what we call orphaned anvils. So you notice they've de detached from the, the storm that attempted to produce them, and all they're doing is they're snowing a little bit up there. And sorry, the video is shaky. At the end, the, the flight attendant came by and, and, and startled me, so I had to <laughs> drop my phone. But uh, just I thought you might find that interesting. Back to those storm complexes rolling right now. This is our lightning data, so you can see that where that front extends. Look at that. And some big storms rolling right through this particular area and some of the new storms kind of showing up here uh, in, in parts of the, the, the western uh, parts of the Corn Belt. Some isolated but locally heavy rainfall. Just remember, those storms that came through the other day really uh, dumped a tremendous amount of rain. So these are quite juicy. I know that Knoxville, Tennessee had like almost six inches of rain out of that storm just yesterday. In fact, I brought along a map just to kind of show you um, what we're looking at here. So let's shrink this up so you can see it. So through seven o'clock tonight, um, this was yesterday. Just look at the storms that came right in through that area. And it's great to see the moisture coming back here with these storm clusters. But remember, with the heat that's still on, we're gonna lose a lot of that to evaporation. Okay, tomorrow, uh, uh, or excuse me, this is tonight, what we're looking at on Storm Prediction Center, keeping an eye on that frontal boundary. Uh, tomorrow, you see, we're just watching a few different areas uh, here in parts of the Western and Central Corn Belt, Pennsylvania, New York, and then also up in the Red River Valley and West. But then as we get into Saturday, there's a short wave coming um, out of the Canadian Prairie. It's coming down like this. It's actually going to meet another wave that's coming out of Washington. And the two are, are really going to provide quite a bit of lift <clears throat> right here in Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And all day long, the Storm Prediction Center has kept an enhanced risk at day three. So we need to keep an eye on that. So let's go take a look right now. We're going to start this off at 6 o'clock this evening here. <clears throat> and as we play forward... I do want to watch very carefully the thunderstorm clusters that are right here on this boundary because there's some hints that they could line out and uh, produce some damaging winds overnight. Um, we're waiting to see if that's going to occur. Then remember the storms we were watching here? Well, this is early in the morning on Friday. They could possibly cut right here across I-80 and then move later that day, watch this, right there through southern Iowa, Illinois, Missouri. And the models have been consistent with developing this in the overnight hours on Friday into early Saturday morning, possibly a nocturnal but elevated uh, system. So it sits on top of the boundary layer. We'll watch out for that carefully. But then uh, the next show kind of shows up in the upper Midwest on Saturday night. And you can see the, the wave right here coming through North Dakota, Manitoba, curls into Ontario, and that's going to drag a front through that could really initiate some pretty nasty storms. Outside of that, there's scattered convection across the country, and you can see it here, but I just kind of tried to highlight the areas we were watching most carefully. Let's do our multi-model analysis, GFS on the left, European on the right. And there's a pretty simple story with both models. Lows are going to curl up into the Hudson Bay, and they're going to leave fronts that just kind of pass through the United States. We're feeding them on Gulf moisture, and, and that's it. So as I play this forward, Here's getting through the day on Friday, into Saturday, now into Sunday. So you see how these deep lows just keep wrapping themselves up. So as we go through Sunday, this is Sunday evening. GFS front there, European front there, almost in the same position. Isolated storm south, southwest monsoon. It's all the same kind of recipe we've seen, but just now a deeper trough over the Hudson Bay. So that first frontal boundary by Monday is stalled out here, increasing the chances for rainfall. It's in both models. Going into Tuesday morning, afternoon and evening, that front's still there, but there's another low that follows. A little bit different position in the models, but it's there and it brings a front through, see it? This is now Tuesday evening, and then that front goes right back in to the Hudson low, see? So it leaves a front, 
and that's what's going to increase these chances of precipitation in these areas and that's why we see that going out there to next Thursday into Friday those fronts just continue to clear through and deliver better chances at rain so we stitch all that together and I'll just show you the European models total precip you can see here that through the weekend let me stop it there on Sunday evening right through here complexes of storms through the western corn belt daily diurnal storms down here in the southeast and the low curling up right here over the Hudson Bay that's critical because as we go into Monday and Tuesday, that front passes through, delivering rain from the parts of Pennsylvania, uh, Appalachian Mountains, and then getting right through the Ohio River Valley, clear back into parts of Nebraska. So that front slow mover, so more storms are forming on it through Wednesday and Thursday. And these fronts are just sweeping through, delivering the rain that's needed. I will make a comment, though, about the differences in the models. Remember, when I show you these models, when we compare the ECMWF to the GFS, these colors are where the ECMWF is wetter. This is the GFS. Overall, for most of the country, especially on that stalled out boundary here, the European model is wetter uh, in this particular situation. And I'll be honest, this, statistically, it's been a better performer as of late. So I'm rooting for the European to be right, delivering these rains in places that need them. The probability of getting an inch of rain is what I want to show you next. And this has just been improving throughout the week, especially here in this part of the plains, getting into even parts of Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. And that's it. That's the shift, which we started this whole briefing talking about coming into to play here. By the time we get to day 10, we still see higher than normal heights here. But the flow pattern is kind of getting washed out. You start to see some redevelopment of, of a high here. But we have the subtropical high in place there. So the flow's coming around like this. The weak fronts kind of run into that, and that's why that week two precipitation pattern looks something like this. Drier inside of that ridge, which is in place here. But uh, overall, we're going to feed these with uh, decent moisture. Something I want to make you very aware of. Watch this subtropical ridge carefully. I know I told you to watch the Hudson Low. I know I told you to watch the Gulf of Alaska, but I want to just reiterate, we got to keep an eye on this subtropical ridge, and here's why. If, if, just if something pushes this around, and this sets up over like Nashville, you end up getting ring of fire precipitation that comes around just like this, and it soaks those areas that are right now in drought. It then sends the southeast over into very deep drought. I'm keeping a very close eye on this subtropical ridge going forward into August, September, and October, because it also influences where the tropical systems come around it, okay? Now, from here, let's talk, uh, oh, real quick, I did want to show you the GFS is very much in agreement with the European. Of course, it has its known biases in the southeast, but uh, it, it's at least showing the same pattern. All right, we're going to finish this up with temperatures here, and then a quick look globally. Today's highs, I mean, very hot once again throughout much of the United States. As we go forward into Thursday, uh, from excuse me, from Thursday to Friday, 103 in St. Louis, going all the way back to Nebraska, low 100s, Kansas, Oklahoma, very, very hot conditions here. And then playing this out into Saturday, that's going to be the scorcher right here in the middle part of the United States. But here's the front coming through on Saturday. That's one that's initiating the severe storms in parts of the upper Midwest. Look at that clearing by Sunday, though. Still hot. St. Louis back to, you know, Norman here. I mean, really hot. But we're starting to push that cooler air through, and that's the first chance we get some relief in New England as well. It's going to be quite hot there. So here's Monday going into Tuesday and Wednesday. Notice by next week, early next week, we're already up here, like Yakima 103 Fahrenheit, very hot through the Willamette Valley, Snake River Valley, Columbia Basin, very, very hot due to the presence of that ridge. And if we just take a look at that five-day sliding window, you can really see the pattern favoring that big trough over the Hudson Bay with the ridge in the Gulf of Alaska. Temperatures here 10 to 15 degrees above normal in Fahrenheit, while a break from the heat coming through in the midsection of the country. Now, how long does it last? I told you we need to get to that. Well, the models are attempting to spread things out. This is the problem. There's very large ensemble spread to begin August, and that unfortunately means there's not um, much guidance into what that ridge is going to do. So right now, I'm going to tell you, your next 10 days, I feel comfortable with day 10 through uh, uh, 15. I don't. There's going to be some changes that are going to happen at that point. Lastly, just a quick update internationally. I put this in my report earlier this week, but I want to discuss with you all as well. The map you're going to look at here is a vegetation health index from NOAA's satellites. And these colors represent worse than a year ago. These represent better. We're just looking here at a pattern. 
Now, if we come over to Europe, notice that there are several places from the Iberian Peninsula through France, Germany, parts of Romania, and Ukraine that right now the vegetation health index looks considerably worse than a year ago. You can also see through the Ganges River Valley, it doesn't look so good in through here. They've had drought in that region. And also earlier drought stress right here on the Yangtze River gave us lower NDVI values, and you can see the vegetation health index showing some stress as well. A wild card for me is what's happening here in the Manchurian Plain uh, and parts of the North China Plain. There are some indications that it's been wet in those areas and the crops look actually pretty good, but interesting to see that the satellite derived values are, are lower. Now, if you come over here, just since we're on this side of the planet, Australia, we've been a bit drier down in Western Australia, but there's improvement coming there. But overall, because of this La Nina, we've seen above average precipitation, especially along the coast, where some places this winter down there have picked up um, several inches of excess rainfall. Now, back over to the Western Hemisphere. We're going to talk more about South America in the coming days and weeks, but just take a look at North America. You can see the influence of that trough coming through here and where the ridge sat so much of this summer. So what's going to change in this map when we break this pattern down is with the ridge here and the fronts coming through, we could see some improvement in the vegetation health index here and in through New England and the eastern Great Lakes. But I'll be concerned to see if we start to see it drop off in the Pacific Northwest and California. And remember, as the heat goes up in California, Lake Shasta and Lake Orville are sitting between 30 and 45% of full pool, which means we're, we're quite concerned about reservoir health at this point as well. Um, I'll stop there. I appreciate your extra attention tonight, and I'll talk to you again on Monday morning. Thank you.